Hi, I'm John Robert Sutton. I travel the globe searching for unique foods that have been shared by generations of families, culture, and tradition. I will connect you to the stories behind well-sourced food and the people and places who make it happen. Welcome to Truth in Food. Today, I have Swedish Eagle here, and he is the producer here at the wonderful Groove Radio in downtown Los Angeles, and he will be asking me questions today about food in general and the responsibility behind it. That's right, and I'm always hungry, always ready with another (laughs) question. How can I get the best food possible from around the world? So I was thinking about you know, personal responsibility when it comes to food. Because if you're eating nothing but bad food, you're going to end up not just being a problem uh, for yourself, but in society as a whole. You're going to end up costing society more money. Your footprint is going to be bigger. It is, and you're seeing enormous amounts of disease and cancers starting at a very young age. And this is all to do with what you eat. Leaky gut bacteria, anal rectal cancers, uh, stomach cancers, all these things are caused because what you're putting in your mouth. And if you think about it, the only thing that you control with your two hands are what you put in your mouth. And it's it's a crisis. Crisis. So what do you think people can do? Like, where do you start? You know, let's say that, yeah, I like to go to McDonald's or I like to eat fast food. I don't really have time to make food. What can you do? I think what people have to really start thinking about is grounding yourself to begin with. What can I eat that's closest to the ground? Um, what is grown to the ground and start thinking of one ingredient. So if you're shopping, if you're buying something, look at the labels and if there's a whole bunch of ingredients on that package, don't buy it. If you're going to a restaurant and there's a whole bunch of ingredients in that bun, in that packaged sauce, don't order it. It all comes to a one ingredient, salad, an apple, celery, um, beans, an onion, salt, pepper, you know, looking at these things as just one source that you then will be able to eat an egg, a chicken, a steak, meat. Obviously with that comes a whole host of deeper situations, but it's not processed chicken. It's not getting a chicken McNugget with 10 ingredients in there. It's not buying a Slim Jim for breakfast, which is just, I don't know if you remember Slim Jims, but that thing single-handedly causes more, you know, leaky gut syndromes and probably anything that's out in the marketplace. Oh, that's terrible. God, when I was in, in the south of France, I had a guest and I said, go out and buy breakfast. He actually brought back crackers and slim jim I, I i couldn't believe it and and this is in the south of france but anyway that you see the getting getting closest to the ground so your answer to my question is when you buy something try to have the fewest amount of extra ingredients other than what you're buying so if you're buying tomato sauce if it just says tomatoes on it you're good if it says tomatoes and 20 ingredients you're in trouble That's true. And why, why can't you make your own tomato sauce? When you think about it, all it is, is buying tomatoes, boiling them, adding water, creating a stew, adding some salt and pepper and garlic and ginger and however you want to do it. And you yourself can make your own tomato sauce. The problem is, is where the preservatives come in because from that factory, when it goes through all the distribution and ends up on that shelf, they have to have enormous amount of preservatives and chemicals so it doesn't go bad. It lasts for months and months and sometimes years. So you bring up something very interesting. The closer the expiration date is, the actual better it is. 
if you look at something that has an expiration date from one, two, three years from now, don't buy it. This is ridiculous. That's not fresh food. So if that thing lasts for years, what do you think it's going to do in your stomach? Right, for that's, years. That's not fresh. That's going to remain in your system for years. Yeah, terrible. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about feeding the spirit in you, feeding your spirit with good food and why that is important. You know, if you think about it, I, you look at many different religions, many different cultures. What was that spark thousands of years ago? It, it was the growth of food, meaning when hunters had to run and grab something, they paused to all gather around and feel that they needed to be victorious, killing those animals and bringing them back to the home. When people didn't realize how scientifically things grew, they would gather around in the winter and think, please, when the sun comes out and it gets warm, that these beautiful crops will grow, the lettuce will grow, the carrots, the apples, the fruits. So this spirituality started coming into mankind and formed many different thoughts and religions. And if you, if you pause and think of the universe bringing in these thoughts, you, you have to look at food as sacred in and of itself. And in, in certain religious traditions, one prays before they actually consume the food. And that, that, that prayer or that blessing or that feeling of positive energy toward that really brings something back to you. You are giving thanksgiving. You are, you are praying. You are benefiting from the fact that how did this get in front of me to put inside my body, my temple? And, you know, there's a great, great, the great um, uh, situation of, of praying that should be a sacred object that you're taking with your two hands and putting in your body that in and of itself should be healthy. That pausing, that, that, that little bit of a pause to give thanks, you should look at that as not a bundle of chemicals and a bundle of junk that you're putting in your own temple. You should, you should stop. And, you know, there's a, a, a great priest, James Mulford, that really is out there on the front lines uh, in the Yucatan, he is he is going to different Mayan villages, preserving their traditions of of making food, of making sure that their way of life is preserved. And his his whole thing is that power of of prayer, of giving that thanksgiving, and basically realizing that every time a flower blossoms. Every time a baby cries, every drop of rain that falls and every tear we shed is a prayer from a higher being. And it, there is something to say for that. There is a calmness. There is a goodness to that. And we are good as, as people. I believe that. And how do we sustain ourselves? It's from what we're eating. And you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And if you, if one can just stop and pause before you put anything in your mouth, just think of making sure that that is as healthy. Forget the politics. Forget the, you know, oh my gosh, this is one cent more a pound. You, this is your sustainability. This is your life. This is your temple and your thanksgiving. And, um, you know, m most world religions, they do have that sense of gratitude for that life-giving fuel for us. Right. So I wanted to bring up another subject, which is plastics. And so much of the food that we buy comes in plastic containers, and plastic containers have become a problem. We used to be able to unload some trash in other foreign countries far away who 
took it, but now they can't do it anymore because there was just an overabundance of these plastics, overabundance of plastic bottles for water. What can we do, and, and how bad is the situation? The, the situation to me is beyond a crisis. It's, it's, it's irreversible, sadly. And what I mean by this is the amount of plastics in the ocean, the amount of plastic, microplastic showing up in our dead seas, in the fish, um, in the food that we eat, it is... It's irreversible. I mean, can you imagine if the Romans 2,000 years ago made plastic, how we would be dealing with that today? So I say forget about the government. Forget about your local elected officials. Forget about all these climate change people and all these fancy people flying their jets all around talking. It's now up to us as an individual to be able to do something. It's your personal responsibility to enact change in the plastic world, nobody else's. So what are the certain things that's happening? You could say, oh, well, Starbucks and McDonald's and all these coffee companies have a paper cup. No, they don't. If you look at the plastic film, that lines the inside of every single paper cup that you think you are drinking out of is causing destruction to the environment. So why can't you bring your own cup? And, and, and I do that. I have my own cup. I have my own coffee cup that I bring in and ask Starbucks to pour, McDonald's, wherever to pour. And that's personal responsibility. The other thing is, why don't you make your coffee at home? Um, grind the beans and do something else. This idea of having filters and having filtered coffee is a scam that was created by a paper company to sell more paper. Nobody should be using a Keurig system. Are you serious? Are you that lazy that you're using a cartridge filled with with plastic and chemicals that are going to be put in the waste because you can't buy a simple French press, which requires no filter, which the coffee's so much better. And you mean that your life is so fast that you can't take the time to give back you're taking. So you're not only saving money by not buying a $5 cup of coffee, but you're not using a filter. A French press basically is you put a couple scoops in, you add hot water, you stir it around, you wait three minutes, press the grinds down and pour out the coffee into a cup. Do you realize how many filters, which are plastic, you say, oh, it's paper. There are microns of plastic in every single one of those yeah. filters. That's my favorite way to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> ah. That's the way it goes. I, I love the French press, had it for years. It's the way, and congratulations. So um, if we're about to take things in our, into our own hands, how important is locally grown food? Where can you find locally grown food, and how do you know that that's any good? Boy, that's a, a, a very intricate set of, of circumstances when something is, quote, local. Um, look, I do believe in the local farmers markets is the place to find your locally grown food. Um, large supermarkets, they, they are bringing it in at the cheapest LCR, which is called lowest cost routing of where those, those foods are all over the world. So they're buying it from Chile. They're, they're not buying it locally. But still, you have to be careful about locally grown foods because let's take California. This is a desert. If human beings weren't here, nothing would grow here. You couldn't grow all of the oranges and fruits and everything in the Central Valley and in Southern California because it's a desert. Nothing grows in a desert. So, okay, you're buying locally grown food where you're importing the water from Northern California. That takes enormous amount of energy. 60% of the electricity 
that is generated in the state of California goes to moving water around this state. Wow. Think about that. That's a lot. So all of that pollution being created by power plants that are using oil, and California has a lot of it, it's causing a problem. So now you're buying, a, let's, let's take locally grown artichokes, okay? They're grown in the desert, so that soil has no nutrients in there. So they're bringing in fertilizer, and they're having to chemically fertilize that land. They are bringing in expensive pumped-in water using enormous amounts of energy making and doing that. So now you have something that's locally grown that doesn't taste very well because it all has uses chemicals to grow it. This isn't its local genetic source of growing it. Same thing with asparagus. So why wouldn't you go to a place like southern Italy, Albania, um, the Mediterranean that naturally grows artichokes and bring them in from there. So not all the time local is good. You know, I think, you know, local produce in some cases are good that can be naturally grown without all of those things. There are avocado farms that exist that can do this. There are certain well water things that that work um, in the San Ynez Valley and up in the Salinas Valley that does use, I mean, I guess you would call that local, but that's another thing. What is local? Does it mean it's five kilometers away, 10 <laughs> kilometers away? Oh, this is local. Well, I, well, where does this come from? Oh, this is from Wyoming. Well, is that really locally grown? So that's a whole nother thing. What right. is local? You still have to drive a truck all the way from San Diego to get up here. So you got to be careful there. Right. So if, if you're having a hard time uh, getting a hold of real locally grown food, how do you get the asparagus from Albania, for example? And, and doesn't that have to be treated with chemicals in order to stay somewhat fresh by the time it arrives here? You know, you'd be surprised. And, and a lot of this stuff is flown in because it can be flown in cheaply. And I'll tell you why. When airlines started charging fees for luggage, a lot of people did not want to pay the $7,500 to have check-in luggage. So they all brought in carry-on luggage. So what that did was keep the belly of the plane relatively wide open for other cargo to go in other than luggage. So that plane has a fixed cost. They know how much fuel's going to be on there. They know how much a pilot's going to cost the the stewardesses everybody else so it costs the same basically if one person and one luggage is on there then the whole belly of the plane is filled with fresh produce as well as people so now you're seeing enormous amounts of fruits and fresh vegetables flown in mm. um not all the time but right. you, you see it more on areas it's a, of the, it's a trend now yeah and it's not that much more expensive um so I think what I'm hearing from you is that every time we're getting ready to eat something, every time we're hungry, we really need to stop and think, what is it that I'm putting into my mouth? Where does it come from? What kind of ingredients are in this food? And it sounds complicated, but the end result will make us much healthier. Is that right? It, it really is. I mean, look, even if somebody is drinking a cup of coffee and throughout your entire lifetime, you've flooded it with chemical sugars and non-dairy milk and, and all. Why do you, you know, I guess it's the flavor and taste, but I remember in my early 20s I was in Russia and I poured all of this sugar and milk in my coffee because that's what everybody else did. And, and this Russian was horrified going, what are you doing? Don't you want to taste the rich taste of the coffee. And since then, I've never put sugar or milk in my coffee ever again. Oh. Because what's the point of buying an expensive cup of coffee and loading it up with almond milk and sugar? It's stupid. Plus this, throughout your entire life, you have just put in hundreds of pounds, if not thousands of pounds in sugar, and huge amounts of chemical milk and additives in your body that your body should not have. 
And I, believe me, that cup of coffee filled with whole milk and sugar is the cause of a lot of artery clogs and a lot of diabetes, and people don't even realize it. Guilty. <laughs> Sorry. So um, corporations think about the bottom line, but not our health. And so I heard you on another podcast with Stephen Mead talking about how corporations come in and, and they buy space in the supermarket, and then they tell the supermarket, we'll give you all this space, but you have to carry nothing but our product. So how bad has that gotten, and what can we do to try to prevent to, to be victims of that? Well, the, the, the situation is, is just simply not shop at these markets. I mean, if you go into these general big markets and they have every trick in the book to get you to go in there and buy these products, there was a study that came out that over 85% of the stuff on these shelves are heavily heavily processed food items, meaning they're full of sugar and processed flours and, and chemical ingredients that, that these corporations are so vast and so big and so ingrained in the distribution system that a lot of these buyers of these stores are lazy. They don't want to work. They don't want to look for new products. What, why? That means they're, they, they can't go home at five o'clock. So, I think companies, new distribution techniques, I think it's up for you as an individual to research some of these really new food products that are entering the mainstream and, and buying it through Amazon. Um, doing your research at, at places like Whole Foods and even Ralph's and Trader Joe's, but you really have to do your research. Right. Um, it is, don't think by just walking in and because you're at a Whole Foods or because you're at a natural section of one of these large markets that everything there is going to be great for you. It's not. Okay. I'll remember that. Um, so we've been buying food, you know, in small containers. You buy what you need. It lasts a week. You go back. You, you know, your stuff is in another container, sometimes plastic, sometimes paper. Uh, what do you think about the idea of, of, buying food in bulk is it becoming more popular are people doing that yeah you know what you're seeing you're seeing some of these things actually taking place um if you're buying bulk food obviously stuff that is is not canned i mean you really have to look at instead of something that's canned in bulk look at something that's pickled you know um actually Pickled foods are very, very good for your good gut bacteria. You know, we have a big battle within our stomachs of the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. And if your system is loaded with bad bacteria, that's leaky gut syndrome. That's inflammation. And you know what? Everyone's like, oh, you're going to get food poisoning. Well, you know what? A lot of times if you eat something unhealthy or you have bad bacteria on you through bulky foods that's canned, you might have a bad day, you might feel tired, you might have a headache. You don't realize that's because your balance of your system is off. And buying bulk in pickled items, you know, slaws that have vinegar, pickles, um, even certain tomatoes, the pickling world having bulk food is really the way that people should be looking into the future as almost a medicine to solve some of your internal bacteria problems. Oh, okay. Solving two problems with one solution. Yes. And it's, it's delicious too. Yeah. So, uh, you travel the world, you are constantly, I'm sure introduced to different foods and, and beverages uh, that we don't have here in America. So what do you see on the horizon are some of the upcoming uh, food items or things that people, I, uh, I remember hearing one of your podcasts where you talked about acai berries, yes. for example. Is that a trend that's up and coming and other trends like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think acai, the trend is here and it's kind of plateaued, but I you're going to see, I think what I'm seeing is a real big um, 
a real big emerging of northern Nordic food and northern food. So you're looking at the Siberias, the Norways, the Swedens, uh, the, 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 the Finlands of the world have these delicious berries that come from the north that we have yet to really see here in mass. And you're also looking at um, meats that are smoked, certain type of fish that are smaller cold water fish um, that um, portion controlled is very good for you. I think one of the great things we can learn from Nordic cuisine is you don't have to have your plate filled and piled up with tons and tons of food. You can have very delicious pieces of fish, um, pickled fish, pickled herring. I'm sure you've heard of this. Yes. With delicious pickled herring with dill um, over a nice uh, full cracker that is actually real winter wheat from the north. It's actually dark, a dark bread. Yes. That's incredibly beneficial for you. You're starting to see that cuisine creep in more and more. Okay. From Siberia, Russia, pine nuts, pine nut milk. You're, really? you're starting to see berries called sea buckthorn, which is a a highly, highly uh, filled berry with natural vitamin C more than anything else in the world. And inside of that, it's orange. It it has unbelievable properties of healing as well. The um, The properties that combat disease within your system have been proven scientifically in Russia. Um, you're starting to see those start creeping in in juices. I mean, once that that alone, that berry, when that enters the U.S. market, that is something that could have profound change on our health. Is it available now? It is not available now. And I've, I've gone to Siberia and Mongolia several times to start securing the product lines. But the fight is, is the federal, the FDA doesn't want a lot of this in here. So a lot of it is political, you know, being from Russia and being from it's like, let's 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 stop all this political posturing because this item can single handedly when consumed by U.S. people can have a profound effect on one's health. Oh, that is exactly what we need. And to get the politics out of it is also exactly what we need. Correct. And I, you know, just a shout out here to. IHG, the International Hotel Group, for banning all single-use plastic in their hotel rooms. So if you go into a hotel, you'll see all of these little shampoo bottles and creams and everything in these small little plastic bottles that you use once and throw out. IHG, uh, International Hotel Group, has decided to have bulk shampoos, uh, on the wall, inside the shower, so they're no longer using single-use plastics. And I and I hope more people get involved with that. And that was also the bulk you were talking about. Right. One should buy larger bulk items like shampoo, like uh, uh, lotions and creams and things like that. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. It's been very interesting, very educational to talk to you today. Thank you for the opportunity to ask you all of these questions. I, I really appreciate it, and i I really fortunate to be here at Groove Radio, being produced by Swedish Eagle here. And thank you for joining me today in Truth in Food. I'm John Robert Sutton. For more information about this program, please visit my website at Sutton Selects. Dot com or follow me on social media at Sutton Selects. Please click the like and follow on the YouTube channel. And thank you, Apple, for having us on your podcast. Have a great day.